All right. Cool. Um, let me let me pray, and then we'll we'll dive in. Cool. Cool. Um, Lord, we are grateful for your incredible kindness towards us that, that you've given us 66 books to, to, to read and to know about you, Lord. It's not everything about you, but it's what we need to know right now. So, so Lord, help us to um, engage your word. Lord, uh, Lord, move through, through me, Lord. Um, Lord, help me to present you and not, not myself. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. You're my name and pray. Amen. Amen, amen. So, so it was the year 1875 when the Fisk Jubilee Singers made famous a spiritual written by former in, enslaved people called The Angels Changed My Name. According to theologians, this spiritual was written, to, was written to rejoice in the fact that although life was hard for the formerly enslaved people, they could cling to God in the midst of their suffering. And that one day they'll meet God along with the heavenly host and they will know their names. Then in the early 20th century, the song took on many modifications, took on a new cadence and then with a new name and his new name was called, I Know I Have Been Changed. And if you have been familiar with the African-American church, this song is the anthem, one of the anthems of the African-American church. I remember as a child when this song would come on, people start dancing and people start clapping and they start rejoicing and the walls start shaking because the fact is that they are rejoicing in the fact that they have been changed by a glorious God. As as a child, I thought this was so beautiful. This is awesome. But at the same time, I was wondering what in the world does it mean to be changed by God? Maybe, maybe you're asking that, that question right now, you know, as I, I present this topic, what does it mean to be changed by the Lord? You know, we, we know that, that we are dead in our sins and that Christ has risen us into new life, but we still struggle with porn. We still struggle with anger. We, 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 we have all of these things that are out in front of us. How do you grow? and the things that you need growth in. Well, that's what we're going to be exploring t- today, how we change. And so inside Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be in verses uh, 17 through 32. And so in this text, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Ephesians, he's writing to a majority Gentile audience who have, and, and so he wanted to remind them is that although they have been changed by God, it requires some, some participation upon their part. Which is which, which this is the main idea of the sermon today. God changes us from the inside out, but it takes work from you to work it out. I'm going to say it again. God does change us from the inside out, but it takes work from you to work it out. To give us a quick definition, what does change look like? To, to be changed by God is to reflect Jesus' righteousness and his holiness and to let that change permeate every area of your life to where you look more and more like him. Uh, as I was preparing for this sermon, this story, sermon, this story reminded me of, uh, this time reminded me of a story about uh, one of the great um, bishops and, and doctors of the church, uh, uh, St. Augustine. And St. Augustine, before he got saved by the Lord, he used to be a sex addict. And, 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 and as he was walking about among and inside this, the streets, one of his old mistresses came up to him and asked him, um, trying to make a, a, a advance at him. And she was a little bit salty about that because he did not respond to her advance. And so she screamed down across the street, Augustine, it is I. And he responded back to her, I know, but it is not I. You see, Augustine was changed by the Lord. Because he was changed, it changed how he responded to everything, even those old vices that that try to hold you down. You see, that's where we're going to be, be in the text today. We, I, I want us to be screaming out to our sins that are out in front of us. I know, but it is not I. I'm different. I'm changed. I am new. So to give us a roadmap for t- today, uh, we're going to be, this sermon is going to have three different moments. First, we want to see what we look like before we have been changed. 
Then we're going to see in part two how we are changed. And then lastly, we're going to see some practical examples from the Apostle Paul, what that change looks like. So here it is in verse 17. It says, so I tell you this, insist in the Lord that you may longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkening in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their heart. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to, to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Wow. <laughs> this is a lot, right? Um, but here's, here's reality. This was us before Christ. You see, as I mentioned before, Paul is talking to a recently converted Gentile audience, mostly, not, not all, and, and he's not attacking their race here because most often when the Bible talks about Gentile, it's talking about it in, in a positive turn. And so a Gentile is someone who is non-Jewish, but what he's attacking here is their spiritual condition, their old way of thinking, their old behaviors. So what are those things? He says that they are futile in thinking and darkened in mind. To, to live a futile life is to live a pointless life, a life without purpose. Then, then he says they have a darkened mind. To have a dark mind is to have, what, according to the text, is having a lack of clarity, direction. But then in verse 18, he says that, he says that if those, those two things are true, then the natural reality from that is what Paul says is an ignorance to God. And when someone does not know who God is, they don't care about the things of God. Which then Paul says in this text that they lack sensitivity, which leads then to a hardened heart. The result then is, we don't love the things of God. At the end of the text it says, they're giving themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. So as, as a summary, what does the old life look like? Paul is saying this, the old life without Christ lacks purpose, spiritual discernment, self-control. And here's the, here's, here's the big one, the inability to repent. They can't see God. Hearts are hard. So he reminds them of their former life. But, but then he just doesn't leave them hanging. He exhorts them to their new life. And he says the complete opposite of verses 17 through 19. Verse 20, he says, That, however, is not the way you have learned Christ. When you have heard about Christ, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to the former way of your life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. If you look back at verse 20, you will see the word learn there. Circle that word. Most often, when you see the word learn, you think about learning a book or learning a lecture or, or learning something on YouTube, which most of us do, right? But Paul's telling them something radical here that they didn't, they didn't have a framework for. He tells them to learn a person. He says to learn Christ, which brings me to my first point. If God does changes from the inside out, the first work we must do is learn the person and work of Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to learn Christ? Y'all, it's more beyond abstract principles and spiritual platitudes as Jesus loves me, which is important. That's, that's a profound thing. We treat those things as platitudes. It's, it's learning him, who he is as an individual person. And learning the things that he did as a person to be loved, to be cherished, because he is beautiful. According to what one of the psalmists says in Psalms 27, 4, he says, I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And look at this, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. 
is to gaze, look at, stare at, meditate, focus on, indulge yourself in the person, in the work of Jesus Christ. But let me see if I can make, make this makes a little bit of sense. For those who know me, you know that I like to cook, right? Um, I, and and it, in cooking, it usually takes about a two to three day process for something, whatever I'm cooking, and people love it. And, and so my, my wife jokes and jokes around, if, if we are going to eat dinner tonight, then I am not your guy, because it's going to take a while. And so we're going to eat dinner the, the next day. So, so my, my wife makes dinner, I make meals, right? And, and so because, because that, that is, and that's our, 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 sh- our handshake agreement inside our, our house. But after I'm done cooking, it's usually something that's boiling or stewing or smoking. And, 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 and the pans and pots that I use is usually layered with all that flavor to where it gets stuck. And so most often, you know, if you're smart, you take some, we take some, some, some solution, some water, some soap, and we spray um, that on the pots and pans. And then we wait. We wait for overnight. Then when we come back in the morning, the dish that was once hard to clean is now easy to clean. Why? Because it soaked itself inside the solution. You see, you see, the dish that was once dirty is becoming fully clean. That is what learning Christ is about. Is that, is that, is that it, it is you soaking yourselves in the glory of the gospel and the good news of what Christ has done. And when you do that, when you soak yourself in the goodness of Christ, it will transform you. It will, it will change you. Religion says to scrape off the dirt, to, to, to put all your effort in it, to white knuckle your change. The gospel says to soak in Christ. Because when you see him, he will say that it is not your own works to be loved by him. He, he done the work for you. He accomplished it on the cross. It is your responsibility. The work you need to do is lay at his feet. You see, that's how the change happens to us. Our change takes place in our lives when when we see the glory of Christ and we seek to be like Christ. You see, for those that don't know who Jesus is, Jesus came from a glorious place. He came from heaven and he came to live a perfect life. He was sinless. But he came for you and I. So he laid down his sinless perfection and took on Weakness and vulnerability in human nature. For you and I, Jesus lost his beauty in his glory, took on weakness. So that, check this, so we can shed our weakness and take on his beauty and glory. When you soak in the glories of the gospel, it will transform you from once those are wretched to being God's most prized possession. So the work isn't to try harder, it's the gaze. It's to soak, to see that he is absolutely beautiful. Do you believe that? That Christ is beautiful, that he wants you. You don't have to do anything to clean yourself up. He desires you. God changes us from the inside out. The work it takes to learn the person and work of Jesus but y'all, there's another important thing we must do in our change. Not only should we learn Christ, but we have to put the work in to work out our new identity. Let's look at verses 22 to 24. It says, you were taught with regards to the former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires. Look at this. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, that new person created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is as clear as day. You were created to be like God. God is what he is doing is that he is trying to do what he created you to be from the very, very beginning. Whenever he created Adam and Eve, he, he created them to be like him, not to be God, but to be like God. So Christ is coming in 
and doing that for us. He's, he, he's creating you to be like him, to be new. So he says, take off the old self. And look at this, it says, to be made new. This be made new is both, is passive, but also active. And so what, what Paul is getting at here is that as you rest in your identity as a new person created like God, Christ is growing you more and more and more to be like him. To be made new in the new identity. So God died, sent his son to die to, take, to help us to take off the old. He's helping us to be made new. And here's your part. Put on the new self. Put on the new self. Put on that new identity. That's the work that he is calling you to, is to put on that brand new coat. Well, let me see if I can make this make sense. Uh, most of us in the room, we are uh, Charlotte transplants, uh, most of us in the room. And, and as, as you would, whenever you move to the city, you need a new place to live because you left your former place, right? And so when you move inside this, this house, and so this was my experience, I noticed that, that there, were, there were dirty carpets, there were holes in, in the walls, there were, the, the yard was a hot mess, um, and there was all kinds of things that I noticed that weren't right in my new house. You see, um, the, the house represented, the old house represented the old people in it. The new house represented the new person in the house, me. I wanted to make this house clean, to look good, to be a place to where I wanted to dwell. So what what I do? I got me a, a, a steamer and start cleaning out those, those carpets. I, I got some putty and start putting putty on the wall. I, I got some grass seed and started to, to fill in the holes. Because a new person has moved into the house. Well, before you met Christ, there was an old person living in your body, uh, which is your house. Now Jesus came in as a new resident, and as a new resident, he is holy, he is clean, he is righteous, and he is trying to make your old house new. This house on the outside, looks old, but on the inside, there's someone new in there, a new person. And as he is doing that, he is transforming you. So even though you are living inside that old house, he can clean it up. E even though you're living in the old house, he can paint it up. Even though you are living in that old house, he can drape it up. Christ came. He came to fill in those holes, to fill in those gaps, to fill in all the broken things and make the broken things new. Your body hasn't changed, but there's somebody new in there. Family, I'm here to tell you today that Christ moved into your house. Those who accepted the message of the gospel, he has invaded, he has moved in. And your responsibility is, is, is to join him in on, on your restoration project. So we got to stop stopping him from painting our walls, from filling in those holes, filling in those gaps, from putting down that grass seed. Because he wants to restore you and make you new. So to be made new is allow God to do the work. Our work is to, to let him do it. So if that's true, right? If that's true, right? We learn Christ to grow. We, we, we are a new person. How do, how do, how does stuff flesh itself out? Um, before, before we get there, I just want to take a quick Diversions, because because I I want I thought about what are the things in my life and the lives of my friends that's keeping them from walking in this newness of life, and I want to call these 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 false identities, these, these things that keep us from putting on the new. So instead of putting on Christ, we put on legalism. Instead of putting on Christ, we we put on moralism. Instead of putting on Christ, we we, we put on mysticism. And so what is legalism? L legalism is someone who is all about duty. At, at the heart, it is someone who is who's attempting to earn God's favor by their activity. Legalists, you are very, very aware of your shortcomings. Nobody has to convince you that you are a sinner. You know that. But instead of learning Christ, 
putting on the new self, you are learning to put on rules. So instead of meeting with God out of joy and pleasure because he's beautiful, you're meeting with him out of duty. And so you put on shame and guilt instead of the new self. The legalists cannot, there's hope for you. You are a new creation. You don't have to prove yourself because Christ came for you. He loves you despite of your sin and brokenness. And when you abandon legalism, you get joy and pleasure. But the challenge is most of us chase after legalism because we can manage that. We, we can manage that. The soak, you got, you got, a, got, a, you got a, that's, that's a 24 hour process. Think about your life. You, you, you got to let go of some control. And a legalist that doesn't let that go, you experience a joyless faith. And you do all the right things for all the wrong motives. And in, in the end, you want to experience the change that you desire. Maybe you're not a legalist. Maybe you're a moralist like, like myself. You don't, you don't struggle with the rules because you make the rules. You are applauded by your moral standards of keeping the rules that you created, right? Um, and, and, and so, and so the, the moralist, you, you have the attitude that you're better than others because you have defined Christianity by your terms. So the moralist avoids gossip, avoids anger, avoids sexual sin, but none of that is done from a deep love of God. It's done for applause. And when applause is your motive, motivation, you'll never experience the change that you desire in your life. I know that all too well. When, when you're looking for applause, when the hand claps stop, nothing is there. But moralist, do you know you have a daddy who is proud of you? Who's always proud of you? Who, who, who saw your brokenness and he wasn't scared of your brokenness because he wants you, he desires you. You see, moralism is beautiful. It's, it's like a snowflake. It's beautiful. It's intrinsic, but it's freezing. You get that? It freezes your soul. It leaves you numb to feeling, indeed, the capacity for sin. But in the gospel, you, the gospel changes you. You don't have to be a moralist. You can hold on to God because he has changed you. The, the, then lastly, I think this is, this is the, the God of this gen generation is the mysticist. Well, this person is, is someone who is a consumer of Christian experience. So you chase the summer camps, you, you, you chase the prayer nights, you, you chase those powerful moments in your life, and those are the things that give you fulfillment. But in the moments, but in the space of these moments, there's dryness, there's emptiness. You struggle to connect with God because your life with God depends on these moments. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong here. We need powerful church moments. That little set we had before, that was powerful. King of glory, right? God came in, he, the, the king. But our life can't depend on these moments. They're supposed, supposed to be in, in hip. They're supposed to aid our time with the Lord. But how change usually happens is like, is like making coffee. Coffee, it, it is a slow drip. of just one drip, one drip, one drip. Dripping yourself in the word of God, listening to the Holy Spirit, not ignoring your sin, not being shamed by your sin, but, but, but moving that, that, that point of, Shame into conviction. You see, I, 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 this is not in my notes, but I think most of us are shocked that we're sinners. But God, God ain't shocked. That's why he came. But we are shocked because we're still operating inside the old self. The new self says, I have been released from my sin. I have been free. I have freedom. So therefore, I can approach my sin differently because it's no longer me. You are not your sin, and it'll never be again. 
So, so that's what change looks like. Right. And, and so the, 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 those are counterfeits to change. And so and so we, we learn change looks like to learn Christ, to walk in our new identities, not in these false identities. So how do we practically live this out? So Paul gives us some some, some, some handles here. And so uh, in verse 20, 25, he, he, he says, therefore, each of you must put all falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body, which brings me to. Um, there, there's five things Paul points out here. The first one is this. Our new identity changes the way how we speak to others. And so often when we are confronted with speaking to others, uh, a little bit of, um, early on, the text tells us to speak the truth in love. We often speak the truth in lies. And so what, what I mean by that is, that is that the old person, when you are called to go front your brother and sister um, in their sin, you often don't say the hard things. Why? Because, because you want to be approved of by them. Rather than resting in your new identity, you have been, been approved by God. You were loved. And so you can say the hard things. Not only that, not only say the hard things, you can confront your own falsehood. And so, and so th- therefore, when it comes to your sin, you don't have to hide in shame and guilt anymore because you are no longer defined by it. You're defined by Christ. You are, being be, you are being made new. And if these things are true, you can confess your sins to somebody. You can, you can be honest to where you are. You don't have to hide in shame and guilt. Number two, in 26, it says, it says in your anger, do not sin, but let the sun go down uh, while you're so angry and do not give a foothold for the devil. Our new identity changes our emotions. It changes the way how we feel. And so, and so the, the reality here is that, is that it does not say don't ever be angry. It says, do not be overcome by your anger. Don't give the devil a foot a foothold. And so, and so for, for those that are new to the Christian faith, um, here is reality. Our God has anger. Why? Because this is a part of his character. If he didn't, there'll be no hope for us. Because he had to be angry at sin to do something with it. And so, so God poured out his wrath, his anger on his son for our sin so we can be made right with him. So anger is not the issue here, right? It's misdirected anger. See, God was angry about all the right things. Righteousness, justice, holiness. We're usually angry about the wrong things. Someone cutting us off in traffic. Our spouse saying something that we don't like. And, and, and we get offended. The old person, when someone says something rude to us, we, we respond out of bitterness and, and hate. The new cell says, they might have said something hard, but I don't have to respond that way because I have been forgiven. I have the mind of Christ. He says, to be, to be made new. Romans talks about to be renewed of your mind. I am changed. So I can respond in extending forgiveness and seeking restoration. You have been changed. Number three, um, and so, it's, so we talked about our, our emotions. Now it's talking about our identity changed the way that we work. Anyone who has been, in verse 28 says, anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Our new identity changes the way that, that we work. Most of us in here, we see work as a necessary evil. So we get a job to pay for our, our, our hobbies and, and, and for our vacations, and we see it as something that we have to do. But did you know that God created work before the fall of humanity, before there was sin? In the beginning, he, see, he, see, he, says, he says that he created humanity and for them to be fruitful and to multiply and go to do the earth. And so work is ordained by God, blessed by God. The old self sees work as a chore. The new, the new self sees work as an opportunity to make much of the Lord. And so often when we think about work, especially in the South, we think about work only in terms of evangelizing, right? And so I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about Jesus in the workplace, but that's the only way we see work. Work is meant, work is meant primarily first, is to bring glory to the Lord. And so in our, in our modern day, when Paul says to do not steal, what he's saying is that do not show up late to work. 
because the fact is that you are a new creation. Do not cut corners. Do, do not do bad work because that is in fact stealing from your employer and stealing from your own joy. You were created to do good work, but, but not only to do good work, but your work is also made for the flourishing of others. And so a question that, that to ask yourself is that, how is your work bringing about the flourishing of humanity? College students, how is your studies bringing about the flourishing of your campus? High school students, how is what you're doing in school bringing about the flourishing to King Jesus? All this stuff matters because it matters to God. Lastly, I got two, two more, sorry. Um, num- number four, our identity changes the way that we speak about others. So verses 29 um, uh, talk t- and 30 talks about not letting unwholesome talk come out our mouths. And I think for us as a campus particularly, this is our greatest bout of struggle. We struggle to speak life. And I think the reason why we struggle to speak life because we're too busy dwelling on the old person. The old person gets easily offended. The new person, the Christian, we should get to a point where we are unoffendable because the fact is that we have been made new. If someone calls you something, guess what? It could be worse because it is worse. If, if, if you're honest, you are new. So, so you don't have to gossip, slander, speak destructively. Because this passage is in light of unity of the church. And what Paul is getting at is when you speak unwholesome talk in in the community, it tears down the body. And when you tear down the body, you are defaming the name of Christ. Christ died for the people you're talking about. They're made in the image of God. And so for an next step for some of us here, you need to ask yourself, are my words being used to impart grace to those who hear, or do they tear down? We're created in a new person, and we're made in the image of God, and God only spoke life. He spoke it, everything to existence. He created worlds. Your words can build someone up, or it can, it can ruin somebody's week. You are created in the image of God. Then lastly, the gospel changes the way that we treat one another. And so the gospel changes the way to, to, to how the, we move from uh, bitterness over to com- compassion. Verse 31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, um, brawling, slander, along uh, with every form of malice, but be kind and compassionate to one another, giving each other just as Christ has forgave you. So that's the gospel message, right? So we can keep going on and on and on, but, but, but Paul has given us five tastes of, of how the gospel should change us right? How it should change us. So, so as we go, come to a, a close, I want to speak to two groups, to two groups, and now I'll, I'll be out here. First group is this, for those who don't know who Jesus is, verse 17 through 19, it talks that someone was futile in mind, darking in thinking, someone who's aimless and purposeless. In Christ, you have purpose, you have identity, so I want you to con- consider the gospel message that was preached today. Would you consider Christ? For everybody else in the room, those who, don't, who, those who do know the Lord, I just want to say two things. You not need to be a good person to be, tra- to be transformed. God did not come to make you a better person. He came to make you a, a alive person. With that in mind, let me pray. Lord, we are grateful for your love and your affection for us. We're grateful for the glorious truth that we have been changed by you. As I continue to pray, I want everyone in the room to ask this this first question. How is God changing me? Just just spend a couple of moments pondering that thought. How is God changing you?
Now you got that. Second question I want you to consider is what are you going to do about it? What do you need me to tell the things that you're wrestling through? Who do you need to repent to? Where do you, where do you, where do you, you need to, to just, just to sit before Jesus? What do you need to do? Remember, change is, is, is about God's activity, but it's still some responsibility on, on our part. So what, what is it? Let's take a few, few moments and ponder. Lord, we're grateful again and again that each week we come here, we get we get a reminder of the gospel. We're thankful that you give us passages like this to to show us what you desire us to look like. And we're thankful that, that Lord, that you sent a means, many means for us, your, your son, the spirit, your, your word, your, your church. We're thankful for that. Lord, continue to keep making us like you, Lord. We praise you. Let me pray. Amen.